Ta. Hi everyone. I won't lie to you, I just finished editing the video. I just forgot to shoot the intro before starting this four day series, top notch organization. But at least I can tell you right now that we're about to see the birth of the automation systems in our project. And that's all I have to say, I think. So enjoy the episode. As a reminder, the previous four working days were focused on the dungeon crawling aspect of the game. I created the dungeon generation algorithm, which handles sticking rooms together and spawning the mobs in the dungeon. I handled the combat system and the mobs basic AI. And finally, I started working on the inventory system. And to be honest, at this moment, I didn't think there would be so much work left on this system. So as I just said, there was still a lot of work left on the inventory system, as proved by this first attempt to let the player drop the items on the floor. But I ended up making this work, for now. Next on the list for the inventory, the ability to move items from one inventory to another. This basic system was not that hard to implement, but it's too basic for the purpose of this game. Let me take back what I just said. Here is an example of how much of a struggle it can be to actually implement that kind of system. As you can see here, I'm trying to remove this stack of two, I don't know what those are, two parchments I guess, but these two parchments are being removed from the other stack of parchments. That's why I have two separate functions now, one to remove a certain amount of items from the inventory and another one to remove a specific stack which is identified by its item type and the amount of items in that stack. In every game that features multiple inventories there is always a way for the player to handle stacks of items. Here I opted for a solution where when you drag a stack of item to another inventory it opens up a panel where you can set how much of the stack you want to transfer in that inventory. You can set it to the min, max or half of the amount and I also learned how to create a slider in order to set a custom amount. I made it so this panel doesn't appear when you're dragging a non-stackable item and I figured that was enough for the inventory system. For now. It was finally time for me to start working on the overworld. So I created the most basic overworld possible with just like a flat area and a dungeon entrance. And if you're wondering which assets I'm using for this game, wonder no longer. The mini fantasy universe is here for you. And it's literally here for you. Like it's the fourth anniversary of the collection and there's a free asset pack available for everyone right now. But there is so much more for you to discover in this universe. You can create literally any 2D game with these charming pixel art assets. Personally, I used to struggle to find assets for my games until I found out this collection. I have everything I need here, from biomes to creatures to props, even UI. There are to this day 51 asset packs released and you can grab them all right now with a special discount that is only available on this channel. So head to the link in the description to start making all these game ideas you have a reality. By using this link, you're supporting this channel and Krishna, the awesome creator behind these assets. Thanks so much to all of you who checked them out, and thanks so much to Mini Fantasy for trusting me for the second time in this adventure. Back to our game now. So we were finishing the overworld and the dungeon entrance. I set a small collider to detect when the player is ready to enter the dungeon and also added a panel to display the dungeon's name, the mobs that are in that dungeon and the resources that can be looted from that dungeon. I also want to display the difficulty of that dungeon and later I will change the color of that text in order to make it clear for the player if the dungeon is way too hard for him. And here's the result. You might not notice it just like that, but the panel is actually synchronized with the dungeon's data. I added a scene manager and now by pressing E you can enter the dungeon. Great, but you can't exit the dungeon yet. And once I added the ability for the player to exit the dungeon, he would spawn to where the player's game object was placed in that scene. So that's when I started fiddling with the save system and I tried to save the point where the player entered the dungeon to make him spawn back when he exits the dungeon. And I also had to fix this camera because it gave me nausea. Now with this working, I thought it was a good time to get the mobs to drop items. That would be one of the ways for the player to collect loot in a dungeon. And that's where I asked for my community's opinion on the discord server. I created a poll to let to decide if yes or no, the mobs would always drop the same amount of items. And apparently, you guys are more for RNG, making the drops randomized. A few moments later, a post was created in the brainstorming section, where one of the members had a very interesting opinion on this. He stressed out that the RNG might lead the player to grind a dungeon in order to get the best RNG possible. So YouTube, I'm interested in your opinion on that. Do you think we need RNG from the loot on the mobs? Feel free to drop your opinion in the comments. And by the 
the way, if you want to participate in the game's creation, feel free to join the Discord server. I'm trying to make you guys participate as much as possible. In this devlog episode, that's the only poll I made, but that's also because I'm in a phase where I'm setting up the system, so that doesn't leave a lot of space for shared decision making. But if you're new here, just know that the game's genre and mechanics were decided through polls. We've been having a brainstorm in the Discord server where the game's core mechanic was found out, and I'm planning many more polls, especially when it comes to adding content in the game. So yeah, you're welcome to join us. For the moment, I followed the poll's result and created a system where you can specify the mob's item drop rate and each item's probability to be dropped, and also randomizing the amount of items dropped for stackable items. As you can see, this system was functional and the items looted are stored in the dungeon's loot which is a separate inventory from the player's inventory. Well, except for this slight issue, which I'm adding to my bugs to fix list. That was all for day 5, and I was pretty glad to have all the dungeon crawling basics done. I knew I could now start focusing on the overworld and on the automation mechanics. So day 6 was focused on building the interaction systems between the dungeon crawling aspect and the overworld. As a reminder, the resource input for the player's factory will come from dungeoneers that rerun the dungeons the players did using the exact same time and looted items from the player's run. This means I have to record the player's loot, not only to make his loot available to him at the exit of a dungeon, but also to act as a basis for the future dungeoneers. And I don't know what my problem is when using assets, Last time, I created my own camera transition system, even though I was using Cinemachine, which has a built-in camera transition system. And this time, I did the exact same thing. I have a really awesome save system, which makes saving in Unity very easy, but instead of diving in the asset's documentation and trying to use it at its full potential, I used this asset to create my own saving system. I don't know, that was weird, that didn't work. It's like, imagine you want to build a piece of furniture, and you have the perfect perfect tool set for that in your garage. But instead of just using your tools to build your furniture, you know, like anyone else would do, you shove them all up in a smelter, you cut the iron bars using your electric metal saw, and you try forging your own tools, although you don't know how to forge stuff. All this just to get a rusty hammer with which you finally try to build your furniture. I really struggled that day, and that's totally my fault, you know? That'll teach me to just read the documentation before trying to use an asset. Once I read the documentation, I tossed my handcrafted, very bad saving system, and I just focused on using my asset which is really cool. So now I could record the player's loot. And one very important feature I added is that when you rerun a dungeon, you can choose either to replace your previous dungeon run stats or to leave them as such. This was a really tough day, mentally speaking. I really felt like the progress was very slow. And that's something I have to work on, I think. Accepting the fact that when I don't know how to use a tool, it takes some time to master it. And yeah, the game will not progress much, but on the long run, in all my game dev career, I'm actually saving a ton of time. Now let's roll back in time to January 2024, when I spent way too much time playing video games with my friend Maxime. Hey. Medieval Dynasty had recently been updated with a co-op mode, so we started a new game. I personally had never played this game, shame on me, but Maxime is a veteran, so he guided me through most of the mechanics, which are not that straightforward. For those of you who don't know this game, I'll make it short, cause I don't think there's many of you. It's a sandbox open world survival set in the medieval times, and you are building your medieval dynasty. You start from scratch and build your first house, and then you can start recruiting new villagers. You need to house these villagers, give them a job, keep them fed, and as the seasons pass, your village grows bigger, you need to pay more taxes and start diversifying your economical activity. Your villagers marry, have children, and I think that's basically all of it. My friend and I, we like to spend time trying to make things look beautiful, to have a beautiful village to work in, for example, and the slow pace of the game allows you to take that time. I would say, however, that the game lacks on the survival aspect. I wish there were options to increase the environmental threats, for example, having extremely cold or longer winters, or on the opposite, very dry and warm summers. I don't have the insights in their code, but I think that wouldn't be too hard to implement. And I'm not mentioning bandit raids on purpose, because considering the state of their bandit AI right now, I think that would be way too much work. Bruh. Bruh. 
So if you're looking for a first person medieval city building chill experience, this is exactly the game for you. Sliding items from one inventory to another is cool, but when you have 20 stacks of items to transfer, this can get a little tedious. That's why I added a transfer all button in the inventory, and for the moment this is functional. However, I'll have to come back to this system later. Now it was time to start working on the buildings, which is one of the major elements I have to get working for the overworld, and what better to start with than with the UI. Yeah. Again, never ending UI. So I started with creating a hotbar at the bottom of the screen. You'll find different menus in the hotbar, the inventory, the building menu. But right now, I didn't use this hotbar at all. I put the build menu button at the top left of the screen. So when creating these UI elements, I found out there are always two phases. First phase, build the UI. And second phase, link the UI to the data in the game. For this first part of the building menu, that means when you click on a category, you want to create as many buttons to spawn a building as there are buildings in that category. I have three basic categories to start with, workstations, transformation stations, and food production stations. And then I actually implemented the spawn building ability. When you click on a building, it will create a new instance of that building, and that instance will follow the mouse until you click again. But nothing right now stops the player from placing one building on the top of another. So I created a system to count the number of times the buildings you're placing has collided with something. It increases when you enter another collider and it decreases when you exit a collider. And as long as this collide number is equal to zero, you can place the building. Now I also added some visuals to indicate whether the player can place the building or not. And that's one system I'm pretty happy with. It's functional. This system, however, is not very handy yet because when you're placing a building, you can only guess the other building's colliders. So now whenever you try spawning a building, the collider's visual is shown on every building that is spawned. Much more handy. Uh, no one saw anything. That's much better that way, right? Creating the building's UI part 2. This implies adding a description card for the building whenever you hover over its button. On this card, I want to show the building's name, the materials required to build it, a short description of the building, the recipes it can handle, and also, very important, the building's category. Every building will have a category, or maybe multiple categories, I don't know yet. For example, woodworks, metalworks, research and science, food production, and every building type will have its humanoid type, which is best at working in it. The most straightforward example here is dwarves being better at working in metalworks, of course, so that's also one thing important to show in that building card. And again, once the UI is built, it was time to synchronize it with the building data. I still haven't worked on the recipe system yet, that's something I'll do on the next day, but almost everything is synchronized here. And just because I wanted to share my progress on the Discord server, and I wanted it to look good, I switched the visuals of the brickyard and the stonecutter to the correct visuals. Now let me present you not one, but two games simultaneously. I bought these in a bundle, and they're similar in many aspects, so that makes sense in my opinion. First off, Timberborn, a city builder with a unique twist, your villagers are beavers. The game revolves a lot around water management as it's your primary source of energy, you need it to water your crops and it's also your primary source of energy for your machinery. You have to anticipate droughts and to be completely honest with you, I haven't played it a lot. I don't know, I just didn't find anything there for me. I think it's a really good game if you like terraforming and, and try to shape the environment to your will in order to make a great beaver city. But before getting to that point, it's a lot of grinding and nothing actually distinguishes it from other city builder games except for its theme, which is pretty unique, but that's not enough to keep me in. So let me jump straight away into the second game, which also has a very unique theme. The Wandering Village has been on my wish list for a long time, and for very good reasons. In this game, you build your city on the top of a giant creature called an Anbu, and your city survival is completely dependent of the Anbu's survival. So here you will find the classic city builder formula, you're going to expand your village ecosystem in order to survive tougher and tougher environmental threats, but you also need to take care of your Anbu's energy, health, hunger and sickness levels, and you can also 
also interact with the Onbu. By advancing in the research tree, you can unlock options to try influencing the Onbu's decision. And this becomes particularly important when you've been stuck in the desert for two weeks and you can finally try telling your Onbu to change direction and head to a milder environment. These two layers of management are very organically linked and all this is topped off with a beautiful soundtrack, amazing and very unique visuals and a very cute Onbu. I knew I would start day 8 by making it so that the building actually spend the materials they cost when you place them. So first things first, I created this debug panel where all the items will be displayed and you can click on one of these to add a stack in your inventory. That will come in handy during development, this way I don't have to run the dungeon if I want to try something. So the debug panel was functional, the spend system was functional too. Get to work everyone, this is a good representation of me on day 8. And I'm so excited to play this game to see everyone working in your factory. I think I'd be a terrible manager. And right then I added visuals to show the player cannot build an item when he doesn't have the required materials. Now for the chests and the panel at the exit of the dungeon, the interaction system I built is based on a trigger collider and when you enter this collider the hovered visual appears and you can interact with the object. I soon realized this would lead to some problems when you're inside multiple trigger colliders at the same time, so I had to rework this. So now when you're inside multiple trigger colliders at the same time, I made it so only the closest interactable item is hovered. And now when you interact with a production building, I wanted to open the production building panel. This panel has a lot of things to show, for starters, the building's name, its category, and if there's a worker assigned to it, the recipes it can handle, and when you select a recipe, I want it to show the input and output items, the progression bar for the item transformation, and the input and output inventory of this building. This whole panel took me around 40 minutes to build, and around the very end of this process, Unity crashed. F I had forgotten how Unity has this very bad habit of crashing when I'm working on UI. This really led to a mental crash down. I think it was a good time to take a break and go eat, but man, I was so pissed when I went back to sit in front of my PC and had to start this literally exact same process over again. Well, it was hard time. So just Go back to work. And this was the result after 40 more minutes of UI building. Well, at the moment, the basic building data is synchronized. That's where I started working on the recipe system. Each building has its recipes. It will show the input ingredients, the output ingredients, the time for this recipe to process, and it also synchronizes the building's inventory slots. There is still a lot of work on that production building system. For example, I need to make my inventory system a bit more complex by making some inventories allow only some types of items. That way, you can't put stone in a lumber mill for example, and then I'd like it to make it so the player can also work in that building. That is however a task for the next devlog since at that moment it was the end of day 8. On one side, I really enjoy how my schedule is organized with four day sequence. So four days on the community project, two days to edit the devlog and four days on my personal project Hidden Tactics. Link in the description. It allows me not to stay too long on one project and like starting the community project after one month on Hidden Tactics was really a breath of fresh air, you know? But on the other side, it's extremely frustrating. Like right here, I was almost done with the production building system. I think I would have needed one more day and I interrupter so that's hard but I'm also super excited to go back on hidden tactics I think I'm starting to find a balance between those two projects and I'm really starting to enjoy developing this community project so see you in the next devlog episode maybe on the discord server if you've joined it I'm really starting to run out of ideas for that play button thing I know press the play button Bruh.